Okay, dear all, we are um, very happy to welcome you all to this uh, lecture by our good colleague, Teddy Lemo. And uh, it's great to see so many of you have turned up here in the auditorium. And this is event, is, event is also being recorded for later use. And it's also being uh, shared on streaming, um, uh, live streaming on Zoom. Uh, and I see, you know, that many are following also from other cities and even from abroad. Uh, as uh, my bit Moser wrote to me a few days ago, this is actually an historic event because uh, as far as we know, uh, uh, Terry's lecture on this topic has never previously been recorded. So this is uh, 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 good for, uh, uh, for later. Okay, so as most of you know, um, uh, Terry is world famous for his groundbreaking discovery of the fundamental building blocks of learning and memory called long-term potentiation or LTP, which is one of the greatest discoveries in modern neuroscience. And he made this discovery already as a young student here in this institute, then located down in the city center row, um, uh, 56 years ago in 1966, so, and uh, in Pierre Anderson's lab at that time. And since then, thousands of scientists worldwide have followed in his footsteps, including several Nobel laureates, such as Eric Kandel, Paul Greengard, Susumu Tanegawa, and many other excellent scientists. So I will not take too much time from science lecture, but I will just highlight some points that he, because of his modesty, probably will not mention. So um, first we have invited you, Tadje, not only because of this exciting story and the fundamental discovery, um, but also uh, because we think that younger colleagues have a lot to, lot to learn from your example. Um, although science is developing rapidly, I think the essence of scientific excellence and academic culture is timeless and contagious. So it's very important to transmit this valuable culture to the next generations and uh, the attitudes that uh, go along with it. And I think that the university should more often and more clearly highlight such great examples so younger colleagues can learn from it, learn from them. So, um, uh, one point is that even very young researchers uh, at the stage of students can uh, make major discoveries with lasting impact, provided the work is careful and thorough and driven by real curiosity and genuine uh, enthusiasm. And this is really wonderful uh, uh, feature of science that st status, uh, status doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are a humble a student or a director or, or, a, or a big professor. The, uh, what matters is whether it's correct and true in the long run. And uh, um, as an experimenter, you are able to communicate directly with the greatest authority of all, the nature itself. So therefore, Ted is always stressing that it's important to spend time in the lab, which is still doing, and have been doing for, uh, for almost 60 years. Um, so, in addition to the well-known discovery of LTP, um, uh, Terry has also made major discoveries in two other uh, related fields. Um, one is regards to how impulse and activity can control synaptic and cellular properties primarily in the neuromuscular junction, and they had a lot of fundamental work and a number of excellent papers. And then lately also how, the, uh, how muscle, uh, muscle activity regulates body temperature. And that was a prelude of that when Rune Henning in his lab um, mapped out uh, the nature paper, how the motor units are, are active in normal rats. And I'll get back to this later paper uh, in a minute. So uh, they have been rewarded uh, with uh, several prizes, the, the Nansen Medal in, 19, in uh, 1981, the Anders uh, Medical Prize in 2003, and is a commander of the St. Olaf's Order, order for, uh, for groundbreaking discoveries yeah, and uh, scientific work. And he even has a patent in gene therapy that he uh, got when he introduced molecular methods into his lab. And he is a part of a long and great tradition in neuroscience that has been covered here in the university magazine Apollon, 
uh, of course, here is lacking an important part. The Moser couple, Edward and Maybrit, who was educated here but moved to Trondheim and had a great success. And he tied himself is commenting on this tradition uh, and this outcome in the, in the uh, Journal for the Medical Association. So Terry is still uh, very active uh, in the lab, more active than more, most of us, including uh, me for sure. And uh, this is from yesterday. He showed me around the lab with you know, really uh, great enthusiasm and, uh, and passion, showed me all the, uh, the instruments, etc. And uh, he, um, and this is not just uh, for passing the time uh, after he got the pension 17 years ago and had been tremendously productive after that. Uh, this, I think, is also a very good example. And um, his, their paper with uh, Ari Nyo and others, Tarsnaken, um, uh, showed that how body temperature is controlled. Um, by muscle tone in rest and sleep in rats. And this was not only in the other paper, it was actually picked out for an award, a great award, 100,000 uh, uh, US dollars. It's on the list, short list for these awards. It will be decided, I think, in this month, actually. And uh, this is one of the uh, highest awards, awards of its kind, or maybe the highest. So this really outstanding work that is uh, still doing. And that's also uh, an important um, uh, fact to remember. Okay, with that, I will uh, pass the floor to the Dean of Research, uh, Jens Petter Berg, and uh, your slides will follow here. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. So, dear Tanya, dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure and, and a very nice invitation. Uh, to be an opportunity for me to be here and uh, give some introductory remarks to to your work and your presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, these are dire times for Europe and including European universities. We witness that uh, Ukrainian universities are targets for Russian missiles yesterday. And I think it is prudent then to go to the roots, look at what is the University of Oslo standing for. And we find this in uh, the, our strategy in very shortly and briefly uh, written. It is to promote independent, groundbreaking, long-term research. It is to educate students with the knowledge, ability, and willingness to create a better world. It is to strengthen the dialogue with the outside world and to work to ensure that knowledge is put to use and it is to be an innovative organization and an attractive place of work and study. Unfortunately, uh, I changed the picture of the university with the Ukrainian flag on top. Uh, it was not in the latest version of my presentation, but uh, uh, you have to imagine uh, it was a moment uh, of reflection uh, when that happened. I will use uh, these uh, points in the strategy to make some reflections on, on, on your work, uh, Tadja. And uh, first of all, uh, long-term potentiation has been uh, already mentioned. And it's uh, first that comes in mind when you think about the independent groundbreaking and long-term research as witnessed here by, for example, uh, the output uh, on PubMed, uh, more than 17,000 hits on the phrase. And also that you can find actually a two minute uh, short introduction into uh, uh, how this uh, works uh, on YouTube. I think that is, uh, says something about the impact. Uh, but you've also worked to ensure that knowledge is put to use uh, uh, during the development of uh, establishing Innovio and also the electroporation based DNA delivery technology, uh, which increase uh, the potency of DNA vaccines, for example. Uh, when it comes to educating students, uh, uh, you have been an uh, inspirational uh, uh, supervisor for uh, doctoral candidates, but also for medical students. And uh, the building is to remind me that I was myself uh, part of uh, 
uh, the students that you have te taught. Uh, I was a medical student back in 1982-83 at uh, the Department of, I was at the Department of Physiology and was in your small group together with Anna Nikolaisen, where we presented some of the basic uh, physiological experiments to you and got feedback. That was a very inspirational time. And I also uh, may, uh, remember that you talked a lot about firing patterns of motor neurons. Uh, that was too complex for me to follow up on. So I became not a neurophysiologist. I went to some simpler fields such as uh, hormone and signal transduction in, in cells. Uh, but anyway, it was very inspirational to, to, to witness uh, uh, you and have you as a teacher. Uh, the second, the uh, fourth part of the strategy is to be an innovative organization and an attractive place to uh, or work and study. And I think at least to be an attractive place to work and study, it is utterly important that we uh, have uh, the right attitudes among uh, all employees at our faculty to follow up on that. And uh, in that respect, I found uh, in your autobiography, uh, a few sentences or uh, lines that I would like to quote, uh, and they are actually not related to your uh, work as uh, a researcher per se, but as an intern general practitioner in a small community in northern Norway at Skjervøy, uh, which is uh, halfway, I think, between uh, Tromsø and Hammerfest. Uh, and uh, uh, on your reflections on being a, a general practitioner, you uh, write uh, that the search for a diagnosis in medicine and a resolution to a problem in science have similarities among them, the lack of a priori answers. And one of the things that you emphasize is the search uh, and to be systematic in your approach whenever it is the diagnosis of a patient or it is a, a scientific problem. And I think that is something that we should all uh, remember and, and keep in mind also when teaching medical students that they have these in, in their minds. Uh, and also uh, what you wrote about, uh, perhaps it has helped me to better see the organism as a whole with many interacting parts at the level, not only of cells and molecules, but of organs and to see functional significance in new observations made in the laboratory. And that reminds, should also remind us of that uh, even though we study molecular details and, and, and go into very deep into a scientific problem, it is important also to keep in mind uh, the big picture. And I think uh, that is something that we also should remember as, uh, as teachers at, of medical students uh, and also other uh, scientists that we have in mind that we must keep, in, uh, keep also the big picture uh, in, in front of us and present it. So with that, thank you so much for being invited to give some introduction to you, Tayo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And now we have um, 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 Edward Moser was not able to come here himself to give an introduction, but has here sent a video. So I'll now um, try to show that. So. Dear Terje, dear audience, I'm extremely grateful to be asked to give the introduction to today's lecture. My understanding is that Terje is going to provide you with an overview of the discovery of long-term potentiation or LTP, the context in which it happened, and maybe also the implications. But let me say from the beginning that this discovery that Terry made back in 1966 is one of the most fundamental discoveries and insights in neuroscience. What Terry discovered is today considered as one of the most fundamental building blocks of memories. He showed in 1966 that if you stimulate cells in a certain pattern, you can make the synapses stronger and that this can last for long times, hours or even days or longer. This is exactly what you needed for memory. And it was then later shown that LTP also has many other properties that you would expect of a memory mechanism. Today, most students of neuroscience know about LTP and they know how important it is, but many don't know when and where 
it originated, that it actually can be traced back to the corridors in, uh, on Karl Johansgate in, in, at the University of Oslo, where it was at that time. I hope you will enjoy listening to Tadje's own story and uh, you know, that you will see how significant it is and that you will remember each term, time you hear about LTP, how important it is. Today, we know that, as I said, that LTP has the properties that you would expect of a cellular memory mechanism, but there have also been numerous studies showing that there is a correlation between LTP and memory, and that if you block LTP, you lose memories. If you enhance LTP, uh, you may either enhance memories or you may block memories depending exactly on the uh, parameters. So there's a universal understanding of the importance of LTP today in memory. And the questions today and have, have, are and have been for many years now, how is LTP implemented in the brain during memory? Not whether it is, but how. And the how question is, of course, way more difficult. But thanks, Terje, for starting it all. I'm sad that I can't be there myself this time. But I hope that we'll meet soon again. And now the pandemic is over. And perhaps I'll see you in Trondheim or in Oslo or elsewhere in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then um, I'll. Uh... Call upon Tadia soon to come up, and uh, maybe she will be she be fit with the microphone. It's great that you would, uh, would do this, uh, Tadia. Looking very much forward to, to your talk, and um... I can put it in. So. If um, some of you on the, on the Zoom also want to ask questions, you can write the uh, remains of Jürgen here with the picture of that, and uh, uh, I will take some questions afterwards. All right. Well, this is rather overwhelming. Um, so I want to thank the Institute for the invitation to give this lecture and Johan Storm and my many friends here for taking the initiative. At the outset, I did not think of this lecture as a kind of a celebration, but rather as an in-house opportunity to talk about LTP as a phenomenon informing us, uh, informing our present understanding of learning and memory. So hence the title. But I changed my mind. I will now say a little more about uh, the discovery and what came after than I had originally intended. The story about LTP is a long one. And given this opportunity, there is much I would like to say. So let's get started. So central to the story is the hippocampus, a structure deep in the brain relatively small, but very important. So if your hippocampus is removed, you will no longer remember who you met, where you were, what you had heard or read or eaten just a few minutes earlier. But you will remember relatively well what had happened weeks or months before its removal and you will have no particular problems in learning new motor skills, like riding a bicycle or something like that. Your general intelligence will also be fine, but you will no longer be able to live an independent life. So at least this was the situation for the patient H.M. or Henry Molison, who had his hippocampus removed 
um, on both sides in 1953. You know, just to yeah. make a change because the people on Zoom are saying the wrong picture because I'm wasting it. I'll just share it again. Oh, you must show me this, yes. So where do I change? <coughs> and then I can use this. Okay. And the pointer. Okay. All right. So at least that was the situation for this patient 8M. Um, so that was we removed the hippocampus in an attempt to cure him for an incapacitating epilepsy after having been struck by a car a few years earlier. So here you see a, a frontal section. Let's see now. Yeah, I have my. I don't get this to work. There we are. So this is the frontal section uh, from a normal human brain. And in this region here is the hippocampal formation that you see here and also over here. And this is a frontal section from the patient HM uh, where you see there is an empty space here where the hippocampus was. So that's what is, was removed. And this is a book that was, came out a few years ago, written actually by the grandson of uh, uh, Schofield, who was the surgeon who actually removed the, uh, both his hippocampi uh, in this patient here. And it's a, it's a very interesting book. And it's rather disturbing also because it describes uh, the situation at that time in the 50s when so many lobectomies and lobotomies were made on thousands of patients. Okay, so we have to go through a little bit about the hippocampus to understand what will come now afterwards. So here you can see the human brain or a drawing of the human brain here with the hippocampus lying deep in there. And this is the um, frontal section that I uh, uh, showed you uh, a previous slide. And you can see how the, the neocortex here sort of rolls up upon itself to make the hippocampal formation that you see right here. And uh, over here, you see uh, uh, the hippocampus dissected out from a human brain. And you can see why it got its name because the shape is so similar to the hippocampus that lives out in the, in the sea. And um, this is the entorhinal area, which is also a critical part here, uh, uh, because that receives information from uh, the main sensory areas of the, uh, of the brain and collect them together and pass that information uh, uh, across the fissure here and into the, into the hippocampus. And this is a drawing made by Per Andersen years ago of a rabbit hippocampus, which is the animal we worked on. And all we worked also on cats and rabbits in those days. That's not done any longer. And this is how the hippocampus would look to us when we were sitting there and, and having exposed the hippocampus by removing the neocortex in an anesthetized rabbit, we could, we could actually see the hippocampus like that. And this is a cross section uh, uh, and a drawing from Ramon y Cajal almost 150 years ago, where you can see here drawing, his drawing of these axons, these um, uh, uh, branches from the, uh, uh, the entorhinal area, from the cell bodies in the entorhinal area, passing down here, crossing the hippocampal fissure here, and then uh, and then innervating the dentate area that you have here, and then the further connections, which you can see more uh, perhaps clearly here, where the so-called perforant path fibers from the entorhinal area will run along what is called the molecular layer here to innervate the dendrites of the granule cells that are here. And, uh, and uh, if you stimulate here, 
with an electrode as I was doing and Pierre and I was doing in those years, uh, you stimulate here, you will set up action potentials or nerve impulses, and they will be conducted along here and excite these dendrites and these neurons here, and they will then conduct their impulses as axons here, innervating the pyramidal cells of the CA3 region that you have here, and then uh, the axons of those cells here will pass down to the fimbria, to the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and other areas, and but they will send an important sort of branch of of of, uh, of uh, collaterals that run back to innovate the pyramidal cells of the CA1 region of the hippocampus. So here you have uh, uh, within this uh, sort of a segment of the or a slice of the hippocampus, you have the entire so-called trisynaptic uh, uh, pathway here, where all will be contained within one slice uh, uh, of the hippocampus like that. And that was set up in actually the, the, the slice and showing that you could stimulate here and record all these things within one slice that was set up by uh, Knusgrede and, uh, and um, uh, and uh, Rolf Escort uh, back in Pierre Anderson's lab in the early 1970s. Okay, so oh. uh, now a little bit of electrophysiology. So again, the same structure that I showed you in the previous one. Here's a drawing of the, uh, uh, of the collection of granule cells packed close together here, densely together here in the so-called granule cell layer here, and then the dendrites coming up here. Here is uh, a collection of axons, the perforant path axon from the entorhinal area, which will then innovate spines. You can see spines here on dendrites from a living mouse in this case here, but there will be spines like that along here, and the axon will pass along and, and will then uh, 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 as the axons arrive there, they will release their transmitter sub uh, substance, and they that will uh, uh, that will activate the uh, postsynaptic sites on the dendrites here, and a current will be generated locally up here that will pass into the cells here and then out of the cells back here. So you get a, a closed sort of circuit here, and then the axons will pass you uh, pass out here. So if you now put a recording electrode down into this region, into this region here, and you stimulate here, you will record uh, uh, the, uh, the response to those impulses that will, you have set up down here. They will be conducted along like that. And then if you stimulate with a weak stimulus, then you will see a negative potential here, the negative field EPSP or a negative flu potential. And, um, and then, uh, if you put your electrode further down, or you have another electrode down here at the same time, you will see a positive, more or less mirror image of that, because this is where the current floats out again. And if you now stimulate more strongly, then you will see down here, you will see what's called a population spike here. And that population spike is the, uh, is the uh, result of a synchronous discharge of nerve impulses that will then run out you know, through uh, to the uh, to the next stage over here. So that's the population spike. That's the population EPSP. Okay, and this is just then drawing an illustration that the, uh, the most of practically all the uh, the excitatory synapses in the uh, in the in the cortex they will be uh, located uh, on spines on dendritic segments, like they, the cell body will be in here. Okay. Now, so, yeah. So here you see the first demonstration of LTP that's already been referred to here from 1966. And, um, but before I describe that, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit of the background. So, in 1964, I met Per Anderson by chance, actually, around in the in the uh, near the, the university downtown in Karl Johanskarten, and um, 
the result of that meeting, I was on my way from Rikshospitalet, the, the old Rikshospitalet up to Ullevo, to look, look for a job. And then I met uh, Pierre, and the consequence of that rather chance meeting was that a few months later I would end up as his first sort of student in his lab uh, 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 with a, a, a scholar or a fellowship from the, the Norwegian Research Council. Now, I had then finished my medical studies in Turnus Tjeneste up at Sherbe, uh, Trumse and Sherbe, as you just heard about, and then as a, as a doctor in the Navy uh, doing my military service, and, uh, and I had to find something uh, that uh, I should do that. And um, so, uh, Pierre, he, um, but in the, in the midst of my medical studies, I took a year off and I went to Pisa, Italy, and did in br briefly brain research. And, uh, and uh, with the help of Alfbruder, actually. So, Pierre knew about this, this work, and a few months earlier, he had, uh, 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 he came back from two fantastically productive years in Canberra in Australia with John Eccles. Okay. So for nearly a year and a half, I worked closely with Pear in the lab, doing experiments twice a week, was the routine, and long into the night. And um, working so closely with Pear, uh, over such a long time, over a year, nearly a year and a half, on his project. That was, you know, not only much fun, but it was also very rewarding in terms of training, being in the lab with him like that. So at the end of 1965, he decided it was time for me to set out on my own. And um, we agreed that I should study so-called frequency potentiation, at the synapses between perforant path fibers from the anterior area uh, to the granule cells, a phenomenon that Pear had already described in two papers in Acta Physiologica, but that I should then look at in more deta detail. And you see here then the, this so-called frequency potential is what you see here in this first train of impulses at 12 hertz that I delivered uh, to the perforant path fiber just before they enter the the dentate gyrus. And the frequency potential is what you see here. You start out with a, uh, a population spike of a certain size here like this. And then during the repetitive stimulation, you see that more and more uh, granular cells are recruited and excited. And then you have even multiple discharges here at the end of the train. So that was frequency potentiation. That was what I was going to, 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 to study. And I don't remember that we, 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 we had any idea then that I was also going to look for uh, after effects or anything resembling kind of some kind of uh, long-term potentiation. And Pierre had already described in his papers on, on in the system that the, the after effects lasted only you know, a few seconds or, or, or a few minutes, which is far too short to have any meaning in terms of learning and memory. But all I saw, when I started to look at the next train, was that already the population spike, and that was seven minutes after the first train. So there was nothing happening for seven minutes. And then the population became uh, larger, as you see. So the same stimulus recruited now more uh, granular cells, brought them to threshold for firing. And they also fired uh, earlier with repetitive discharges. And then at the 10th train, and there were 22 <coughs> minutes between the 9th and the 10th, you see uh, that uh, the population spike is high. But I have put in, so these are the, this is the original from that slide I showed in 1966. I've just drawn up here so that you can see the difference between the beginning and at the end of the 20 min 22 minutes in this case. Um, uh, you see the, the increased slope of the field EPSP that was monosynaptic. That means in response to an, uh, the same stimulus, it is more effective synapses. And you see that many more uh, granular cells are recruited and, and they appear now at a much later, uh, much shorter latency, which means also uh, more efficient synapses. 
Okay. And this is just a plot of what that happened here. And this is actually shows some of the basic phenomena of the of, of LTP, as it was later known, that uh, as you uh, deliver several of these trains with intervals of seven minutes, and in this particular case, 22 minutes, I don't know why I chose that particular pattern, but anyway, uh, with the repeated trains, you see that there's a gradual increase in the potentiation and reaching a plateau like this. So then uh, in, the, in the abstract from that paper, it says that this is an example of a plastic change in a new neuronal change expressing itself as a long lasting increase of the synaptic efficiency. And that the effect which may last for hours is dependent upon repeated use of the system. Okay. So uh, now, So I was now doing all the experiments on my own using Pierre's lab on days when he did not. And I remember telling Pierre about my new findings and had Pierre been smarter than he already was, he would have said, this is important. I'll turn the lab into, this is what we are going to study and we're going to do it together. And, and um, you know, if, if if that had been the case, uh, I think it would be very likely that Pierre would have had been well priced. Uh, and if I had been more or ambitious or, or smarter, I would have let my whole thesis become a study of LTP. As it were, neither LTP nor frequency potentiation became part of the thesis that I defended three years later. Nevertheless, we were well aware that my findings might have something to do with learning and memory. As you can see here from some of the right the draft, some of the notes I made at the time, and which I also happened to send to Pear in this case. And you see that uh, this is my, um, my supervisor then, who apparently didn't like much of what I, uh, what I uh, tried to say. But if you read inside here, it says that the effect is long lasting and the induced increased efficiency shows no tendency to fade after periods of rest of up to 22 minutes in this experiment. In other experiments, increased efficiency is seen for hours. And over here from my own notes and my own crossing notes, which are almost as vigorous as those over here, uh, if it is correct that the hippocampus is involved in memory function, this is a region where one should expect long lasting changes in synaptic efficiency to occur. So we were aware of it and we didn't do much about it. <laughs> okay. Um, now, okay. Now, central to this story is Tim Bliss. So, Tim Bliss, he was from the outset interested in learning and memory. He took his PhD in Montreal where also Hebb was at the time, and, um, and um, he was studying synaptic plasticity in the neocortex and got nowhere, according to himself. He got his PhD, but, but, um, but the, the neocortex was just too complex at the time for the techniques available then. And, uh, and, and then he happened to read a paper by, by Pierre on, on the hippocampus and realized that the hippocampus is a structure much more, uh, 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 you know, um, easier to study because of the laminated structure there, and for doing so-called field potential studies also. And um, and uh, so, uh, Pierre was in London for some uh, in some business uh, in those early years, and uh, and uh, Pierre met him. And, and, uh, and asking if you could come to, to Oslo and learn about the hippocampus and, and field potential studies. And then according to Tim, Peer, Peer said when he heard he was interested in learning and memory that you should come to Oslo and, 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 and see me because I had found something that would interest him. So Peer came and um, I, uh, Tim came and um, in, um, in, 60, in the autumn, in August in 1968. And um, so we ended up then doing the experiments 
uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, was later published in 1973, five years later, in Journal of Physiology. And uh, according to Tim, he had to persuade me to, 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 to actually do those experiments. And it was actually a, a sideshow because I was, to, 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 so we did these experiments in between all the other things. I was finishing my thesis and, and Tim was busy with other uh, projects with Pear in Pear's lab. By that time, I had got a separate upset uh, set up in, in Pear's lab so we could do our experiments there quite independent of you know, what happened in the other lab. And, um, and so um, maybe we would do uh, experiments on in between all, 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 all the rest. So, um, but anyway, it, um, yeah, so, so this is just uh, the, uh, uh, a figure from that work in 73 that so frequently, uh, frequently um, uh, reproduced and referred to. So now, uh, so I had in my thesis, I had also been sort of shown that the peripheral path fibers from the anterior area, when they approach the, the dentate gyrus underneath here, uh, they would fan out and then innovate sort of lamellas or, or segments of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the um, uh, dentate or the, the whole hippocampal formation. And, but that meant you could set, use a conditioning stimulating electrode here in the experimental pathway, and then you could use a common test stimulating electrode down here in, in this, what we call the angular bundle, and so that you could test the efficiency with this, and then you would test it in a controlled pathway, in, in an experimental pathway where only those fibers were tetanized. And, and, and then you would have the same test stimulus you delivered to a control pathway where no uh, uh, tetanization occurred. And the result is what you see uh, over here, uh, where uh, before conditioning, before tetanizing here, you see the, uh, the field potential here, the negative uh, field EPSP here, similar in the uh, uh, in the experimental and the control pathway. And then after conditioning, you see the rather dramatic increase in the amplitude and the slope of the, uh, of the monosynaptic field EPSP, whereas there's no change in the, in, the, in the control. And this is just the plot of that. And you see with the repeated trains of stimulation, you can augment and increase the concentration stepways until what appears to be a saturation up here and, 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 the, and, and the, uh, the potentiation would, would persist for a very long time. This was in the anesthetized animal. Okay, so in um, 19, uh, so then uh, uh, this paper uh, was reproduced uh, in full in, uh, as a landmark paper in uh, Journal of NIH uh, research, which has now disappeared, that journal, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Tim and I were uh, sort of interviewed for that paper, and uh, Roger Nickel made comments, and among the comments you can see here, he said, so the question is, why did this paper start this dramatic field? First of all, it describes all of the basic phenomena of the process of long-term potentiation. These include pathway specificity, saturation, and an increase in the coupling of the synaptic potential to the discharge of the granular cells. Second, there is not a single controversial result in that paper, a very remarkable thing in this field. So that's sort of nice. Um, okay. Um, Um, all right. So I defended my thesis in October uh, 1969. Um, Tim was then at the end of his uh, uh, year stay with Pear, and soon we both left for London 
came to take a position at the National Institute for Medical Research at Mill Hill in London, and I went as a postdoc to the Department of Biophysics uh, at University College London in downtown London. And then at Mill Hill, Tim set out to continue our research on LTP because we, we considered we still had something more to do before we wanted to publish it. And sometimes I went up to Mill Hill to join him. And then to our great surprise and dismay, we were unable to reproduce the results that we had obtained in Oslo. And that was rather, rather <laughs> a surprise. So after a year and a half in London, I returned to Oslo in 1971. And later that year, year Tony Gardner Medwin came to join me and we should both study, uh, and we were both intent on, on continuing with LTP. Because Tony Gardner Medwin, he was the co author. Because when Tim uh, uh, came, uh, then started at Mill Hill, he started up a collaboration with Tony Gardner Medwin in his lab, which was actually very close to in the same building where I was working uh, in biophysics. He was in physiology. And um, and, uh, and there they did the, the chronic experiments with implanted electrodes in, in, the, in the anesthetized animal and showed that they could also reproduce the, the uh, long-term potentiation uh, in, in the uh, chronic animal and see that the effect lasted longer than what we could have seen in the, in the uh, anesthetized animal. Uh, but when, so when Tony then came to, to Oslo and we started a year work together, uh, and we started to, to, to work on the, um, on the anesthetized rabbit again, uh, uh, we didn't see any LTP. And we did all sorts of things and couldn't see it. And um, so this ended with Tony and I giving up on LTP for good. Tim, for nearly 10 years, he returned with a paper on LTP in 1982, but by then Graham Goddard and his colleagues in Halifax had demonstrated LTP in rats in vivo, and Philip Schwarzkroen and Knut Wester had shown LTP in the hippocampal slice in Pierce lab in Oslo, and both papers appearing in 1975. And yet we were unable to do it. So why did we fail so spectacularly? Well, I think there is an explanation, and if you are interested, you can have a look in this paper. So I wrote, I, I wrote a review and invited a review for Acta Physiologica on this, where I, I discuss, among many other things, I discuss why we failed. Okay, so when I finished my thesis in 69, I submitted four single author papers. That was the custom at that time, should be independent work. Uh, and uh, I, I, I submitted them to experimental brain research. The reviews were not bad, but asked for some changes. And that took me some time. So in March 1970, I received a letter from John Eccles, who was the editor of experimental brain research at that time and also one of the reviewers, and I, can, I, I, I knew it handwriting because I'd seen that, and, uh, and, um, and I knew he was also one of the reviewers because there were comments in the, in, you know, on, the, on the manuscript, uh, the original manuscript, which was by, at that time returned by post. So, and, and here he said, and then I re received a letter from him and it says, I have been wondering for some time about your hippocampal papers because I hadn't returned them. Um, I'm sorry that you have not made some of the changes, suggested alterations and sent them in to me because they would certainly have been accepted for publication. Perhaps though, it's better that you think some more about them. Please do appreciate that the referee and I both think very highly of the paper, so you should not be depressed about them. <laughs> Okay, I then revised the two first papers, which were published in 1971 in Experimental Brain Research, but the last two remained in my files until 40 years later, 
when using only original data and figures, I merged the two unpublished papers and submitted it to the hippocampus. And, and here it is. So that came out in 2009, but was based on experiments and figures and analysis made 40 years earlier. So, and the title was Excitability Changes Within Transverse Lamella of Dentate Granule Cell and their Longitudinal Spread Following Orthodromic and Antidromic Activation. And that was sort of half of my, 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 my thesis then. Okay. So, uh, after our paper in 1973, Tim became a prominent person in the field for the rest of his career, whereas I left the field. So it is perhaps not so surprising that he was the one to become credited with this discovery as reflected in this citation here. So this is from the textbook, Neuroscience edition 2002. Work on LTP began in the early 1970s when Timothy Bliss and his colleagues at Mill Hill in England discovered that a few seconds of high frequency stimulation can enhance synaptic transmission in the rabbit hippocampus for days or even weeks. So about everything that's in that text is wrong. And yeah, let me see. So Tim, however, never made any such claims. And when Science published a news and news report at that time that made the same claim that he had done, made this discovery. Tim published a rebuff, uh, rebuttal in the next issue of science. So that was the state at that time. Now, here is how Matthew uh, Cobb uh, describes this rather awkward part of the uh, story in a very excellent book, The Idea of the Brain, covering the story of understanding the brain uh, from the time of Aristotle to today. And it's actually a very good book. But here he says, based, because he has read mine and he cites my, my own review in uh, uh, LTP in, uh, in ACTA. So he said, Lermo had first observed the effect in 1966 and had subsequently worked on the subject with Bliss in 1968-69. But problems of replication led them to continue fiddling around, trying to be confident on what they had discovered. Eventually, even though they had not resolved these problems, they decided to publish anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all correct. I don't have any problems with it. Although Bliss and Lermo both left the field for a while, nearly a decade for Bliss and 30 years for Lermo, <laughs> other researchers picked up on the effect, which became known as long-term potentiation or simply LTP, and the number of papers on the topic soon grew exponentially. <clears throat> okay, now, so as it were, failing to see this LTP in these anesthetized rabbits for some reasons that you may find elsewhere. I returned to the experiments that I did in London in 1969-1971, which had been very successful. Because, and they showed that chronic direct stimulation over several days of denervated skeletal muscles in freely moving rats removed all denervation hypersensitive to acetylcholine <laughs> and restored the muscle fiber membrane to normal along its entire length. The result turned the accepted dogma of the day upside down. It stated that nerve-derived trophic factors controlled membrane and contractile properties, and that it was not uh, related to nerve impulse activity. In our experiments, and this was with Gene Rosenthal, any possible influence of nerve-derived trophic influence had been removed by the innovation. Only evoked impulse activity could explain the result. But dogmas tend to live on. Experiments and arguments in favor of the trophic hypothesis continued to be published uh, and produced in textbooks 
in, uh, in, uh, in um, handbooks um, for another 30, 40 years. So this, this situation kept me busy throughout these years, working out that the trophic factor as postulated just could not exist. Instead, our work here in Oslo established that it is nerve evoked impulse activity and particularly different patterns of impulse activity uh, that control not only muscle fiber membrane properties, but contractile properties and neuromuscular sinus formation as well. Today, the story is over and you will have a hard time finding any mention of it in today's publications. And it took about 10 years for LTB to be generally accepted as a potentially important mechanism behind learning and memory. In contrast, the evidence against the trophic hypothesis caught immediate attention and was widely presented in textbooks and reviews all at the time. So I discussed this difference in an invited essay in Annual Review of Physiology from 2016, in which I conclude as follows. Discovering a new phenomenon has greater impact in the long run than discovering that something previously held to be true is wrong. The first type of discovery leads, as in the case of LTP, to further work and new insights and discoveries. The second type, as in the case of the trophic hypothesis, may involve a large body of work by believers and non-believers alike, but will eventually fall by the wayside and be forgotten. Both types of discoveries have impact as they change the direction of research, but only one of them will stick in the minds of subsequent generations of scientists. Okay. So, so what's LTP about? So now I'll try to spend the rest of my talk uh, on, 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 um, on LTP uh, and it's um, how it affects today's research and, and pick some examples. But first, what is LTP? Uh, the process of making a weak synapse in the brain stronger and making that increase persist after the stimulus. What does it do? It continually affects how impulses are rooted or information transferred within and between neural networks in the brain. Why is it important? It lays down new circuits in the brain where events and new motor programs may be stored and later recalled as memories of facts, events, thoughts, or as new skills. Okay, so I'll try now to explain uh, some of the mechanisms behind LTP, how it comes about. And uh, you should then sort of consider uh, a dendritic segment from a nerve in, in, the, in, the, in the cortex with a strong synapse and a weak synapse as neighbors on that same segment. And now if impulses come along pre to the presynaptic terminal here at the strong synapse, then glutamate will be released as the transmitter. It will be bind to two types of receptors, the AMPA receptors and the NMDA receptors. The glutamate will open the AMPA receptors and, and current will flow into the cell and will set up an, an excitatory postsynaptic potential, so a depolarization, which will be quite large because this is a, a strong synapse. And then that depolarization will spread for some distance along that segment of dendrite. And that will also affect the nearby uh, weak synapse, which will also uh, contain uh, uh, AMPA and, uh, and uh, uh, NMDA receptors, or sometimes perhaps not AMPA receptors, only the NMDA receptors. But it will affect, so at this synapse, when impulses arrive here and glutamate is released, it will bind to both these types of receptors. It will, have an, it will open up the NMDA receptors if they are there, 
and they will generate a depolarization, but it will be very weak because there are very few AMPA receptors in a weak synapse compared to a strong synapse. It will also affect uh, the, the NMDA receptors, but it will not open them because there is a magnesium ion in the channel that blocks it. But that magnesium can be ejected by the depolarization uh, arriving from the nearby strong synapse. And when that happens at the same time that the magnesium ion here is ejected out and glutamate arrives here, these NMDA receptors become open for calcium. And calcium will flow in, and that calcium that flows in here will activate a number of cascade of protein kinases and enzymatic uh, reactions, postsynaptic. And the end result of that will be that AMPA receptors that are stored here in vesicles uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the spine, they, it will be inserted into the postsynaptic membrane. So that the now, this will become a strong synapse and it will become larger. And there will be retrograde signals passing from the postsynaptic spine to the presynaptic terminal. So also that will grow inside. So they become matched. And, and you can see the actual, you know, if, with your eyes uh, in the, on the microscope, you can see this growth of a spine. In this particular case, this is in a slice. Uh, you can apply glutamate here to this small spine where the weak synapse is, you don't see the terminal here. And then already two minutes off, and also here in this, you can remove the magnesium here in, your, in, the, in the solution that the slice is in, so the magnesium will not be there to block the channel. And then, so calcium will flow in, and you will see two minutes afterwards, you will see uh, in this image here where the, uh, the, the lighting up uh, and indicating the increase in the concentration of calcium. And, and, and you see at the same time the growth there. Okay. So uh, the condition here for actually making a synapse, a, a weak synapse strong, is that uh, they must be close together, they must be close to strong synapse uh, on, 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 on a synapse, and they uh, must occur at approximately the same, at, at the same time. Okay. So now there's one before I go to, to, to modern experiments, uh, I would like to uh, just emphasize the following. Uh, if a mouse or, or a rat is exposed to a painful stimulus, it will respond rapidly with freezing. So you'll have a behavioral response. And the reason for that, that there is already an established pathway through the brain with strong synapses so that when you get the sensory input here, it will pass through here and you will have the behavior out here. But you, it's now very clear that in the brain there are relatively very few strong synapses. Most of them are, are weak. So because axons send off, not just this one, but all of these axons send off numerous collaterals and they send them far away to other parts of the brain or even the hemisphere on the other side. And, and they will either make silent synapses or weak synapses, or they will make new synapses because they will have uh, terminals there lying, you know, ready to just uh, sort of uh, jump down on, on, on a spine and make a new synapse. So you have these types of excitatory synapses. And again, AMPA and NMDA receptors are critical. So you can have a silent one where there are no AMPA receptors, only NMDA receptors, and you won't see any response normally. Or you can have a weak one where there are few AMPA receptors, or you may have a strong one where there are many AMPA receptors and it becomes very efficient. So what would be the so-called purpose of this? It is that it, it would allow rapid formation of new and strong synapses through LTP. And certain conditions must be met. There, there must be nearly coincident activation as you have in a conditioned response. And, uh, and uh, you have also other uh, terminals from other nerve cells ending very close here, which can modulate the, the degree of LTP by releasing 
uh, a transmitter such as dopamine, acetylcholine, or serotonin, and, 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 and these transmitters are, are related to, you know, uh, reward, punishment, motivation, and these sort of things. Okay, now, so now I come to, to, to an experiment by uh, uh, Roberto Malinov and his people on, um, on, uh, on mice. Well, so much of this recent work is done these days because you can have transgenic mice. And, but anyway, uh, they set up, so we are here. They set up a conditioned reflex by exposing the, the mouse to an electric shock and it will freeze. And then they will pair it with a tone. And I've heard just a few such pairings when the mouse will get the shock at the same time as it hears the tone, it will associate, it will learn that tone means shock. And so very soon uh, it will respond to the tone alone with freezing. It had learned something. But then with modern techniques, you can inject adenoviruses, associated adenoviruses into local regions of the brain, and they will infect neurons there locally. Or you can target specific neurons with particular promoters, becomes very selective, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and then you can make these neurons there express new, uh, uh, new uh, for example, channels. Channels that can open when they are photo illuminated by lasers, by a, foot, by a, 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 a fiber optic probe that are, is inserted exactly into the same region. So you can activate these neurons artificially. And, 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 and then I'll, I'll, I'll just soon explain the pathways for this, but then instead of using the tone, they can then use such photo illumination, activating exactly the same terminals that the tone will activate and so set up a conditioning response to the laser, which is uh, uh, or a freezing response to the laser, uh, just as they can with the tone. And then here is the response. If they, if they, if they uh, deliver the tone and the shock uh, un, um, uh, unpaired, also with the uh, distance in time between them, they will, uh, they will not associate and they will not learn anything. But if you pair them, they, uh, they learn it. And, and, this is, and, and it's the same learning uh, with, the, um, with the laser uh, illumination as with the natural tone. And the beauty of, this, the beauty of this, such experiment is that you can, you can then through photo illumination of specific pathways, you can induce, uh, 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 you can induce uh, LTP long-term potentiation in those particular synapses. Or you can, uh, you can uh, uh, induce long-term de depression, which is the opposite of LTP. And, and when, when you do that with a different pattern of stimulation, you erase the LTP. And then you will see what happens. And I'll try to explain that. That, that, that is actually shown, uh, is shown here, but I'll try to explain it in a different way. So here now, you have these two. You can either, uh, you receive the tone uh, and, and, an, and an el the electric shock over here. This is the pathway. So the, the shock is a sensory stimulus to the feet and, and the information of that will arrive eventually in the uh, corpus uh, geniculum laterale and, and then pass on to the amygdala, which is the center for our emotional uh, uh, anger responses, and uh, and 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 then the conditioning uh, from the ear will go to the medial geniculate nucleus, and then it will go also to the cortex, the auditory cortex, and both of them will send their axons uh, to the same region in the uh, amygdala, uh, uh, but those synapses will be weak until you pair the two stimuli and, and, and make those synapses stronger. So this is the explanation of what's happened. You give the, the, uh, the shock, 
and you have this established pathway leading rapidly to freezing. And then, and this would be before LTP. If you give the tone alone, you will, of course, it will hear the tone, but it will not freeze because it doesn't associate that because the, this pathway here will not have access to, to, to this pathway here that results in the freezing. Unless, because though there, are, there are obviously nerve terminals there uh, ready to make synapses or they are silent synapses or they are weak synapses, they are there, but they will not have any effect, measurable effect. But then when you combine these two, then you set up the situation for having LTP. And, 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 and because these arrive at the same postsynaptic uh, uh, cell along the dendritic, as I explained earlier, they are close together, they happen at nearly the same time, then you have the condition for inducing the LTP at these weak synapses here. This becomes strong. So after this pairing, and you deliver the, the, uh, the tone alone, then you have access to this pathway and you get the free seat. And now with the new techniques, you can then in this pathway, you can inject an, a, an adeno associated virus that encode, for example, this channel rhodopsin 2, which then gets inserted into the membrane of these neurons and will open up uh, uh, to photostimulation and, uh, and, and you can induce, uh, evoke action potentials or nerve impulses by just stimulating them photically, because you can then uh, 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 place an optic fiber for stimulation in this part of the uh, amygdala where these uh, terminals uh, meet. And so with this system, uh, they start then with the conditioned response already established. So you have the conditioning stimulus uh, here evoking freezing because of the learning here. And then they stimulate here through the photic probe with low frequency stimulation, which will erase the LTP. And when they try afterwards, then with, um, uh, and then if they then stimulate with the uh, with the um, uh, conditioning stimulus alone, they will have no freezing because now you have erased the LTP. But if you then, after that, reintroduce LTP by photostimulating with a high frequency, rather than using here where uh, of LTD, where they use 900 impulses at one hertz for 15 seconds, that's sort of a usual procedure. Uh, whereas over here, they will use brief trains of 100 hertz uh, high frequency train. And then they will reintroduce LTP and then delivering the conditioning stimulus alone, you will have freezing. So you can play with this. They can do it over and over again. It's fantastic how by, by eliminating or, 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 um, or reintroducing the LTP, you can eliminate or reintroduce the behavior, what the memory of what of that, okay, yeah. Um, so the last uh, experiment uh, is by, uh, that I will uh, try to explain, is the, um, is won by uh, Tonagawa and, um, uh, Tonagawa and his people. So in this case, they use transgenic mice that, um, will express an early immediate or immediate early gene, CFOS, and there are several of them. And this, these early immediate genes are such that they will be expressed when you experience something new, unexpected, or painful, something interesting. Then they also use adeno-associated virus, which they inject into the dented gyrus in this case, uh, which will then cause the expression of this channel rhodopsin, which will open to photoillumination, an artificial protein in the membrane, so that you can artificially uh, uh, activate uh, these, these cells and terminals and their terminals. And in addition to that, they also manipulate the system such that 
the expression of the CFOS and, 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 and these uh, channel rhodopsin uh, channels, they will only occur if the animal is on something called doxocycline in the drinking water. And the, and, but if you take the, the, this uh, doxycycline off the, uh, for, a, for a period, then you will open up for this expression of CFOS. And in addition to the CFOS, uh, there is also the expression of gene fluorescent proteins. So those cells can be actually labeled that, that respond to the photoelimination. They can be labeled. Or, or not only to the, but, but, but also to the, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, sensory stimulus. So anyway, uh, with that setup, when the animal, let's see, here we are. When the animal is in a box and receives a shock here, if it's then off dops, a few of the cells, the dentate granule cells now, will become labeled by CFOS. CFOS will be expressed because receiving a shock is something that it will notice. So they will be labeled and, and you see them here. This is actually a control. So now if they have the animal on dogs and they give the shock, there will be no labeling. So the technique works. But if you take it away off dogs, then you see this labeling. And these are the memory cells, the engram cells, uh, related to this particular experience of receiving this shock. And the, the, these cells here are just very few of the many granular cells that are there. So that's another sort of rather interesting thing that it's only a few of those fantastically many that are already there will be labeled by such an experience. And then, so then you do. So now you can take this. Uh, so now the, the, these engram cells, making this ensemble of engram cells here. Now they are now uh, there in the in the, uh, uh, and they are uh, and they are indicated by the green fluorescent protein, which they will express at the same time. Now you can move this mouse to another mouse and to a different context. So when it is in that context, it will, not respond, it will not respond by freezing because that context is different from the context where it received the shock. And, and so the, 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 our brain is very discriminative in this way. So we will differentiate very well with, uh, so, the, the, so anyway, we will, they will not. But if you foot to illuminate it in this, then they will freeze because you can selectively photolate and then they will freeze by that artificial illumination. So now, using this system, you know, this, this is the last experiment now, uh, using this system, they, uh, they have now, in addition, they have now injected adenal associated virus in the entorhinal area, which will infect uh, the uh, neurons there that will send out their sorry send out their axons to um, uh, as perforant path fibers to the dentate gyrus and and because they will also express this uh, uh, this uh, channel rhodopsin so they can be uh, 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 activated artificially you can now uh, so you. Uh, and then the, also the green fluorescent protein, you actually see the perforant path fibers here. The green ones here are perforant path axons, and they have the artificial channels inserted into their membrane. So they can be artificial, rather than in the old experiments where we put our electrodes and stimulated them electrode and everything else that was around, they can selectively now stimulate the perforant path fibers. And, 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 and then at the same time, they have used a different color to, 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 uh, to mark the, the engram cells when the cells are exposed to, to, to this shock. So here you, see, here you see the blue ones here are all the granular cells. 
And then you have these rare engram cells that responded to the shock by CFOS. And, and you have two of them here, and you see they are few relative to all of them. But the, again, the beauty of this is it's not only the selectivity, but it is also that you can now, since you can take out slices from these uh, animals and put them in a dish and see all this with the fluorescent microscope and put your electrodes where you want to put them. And then they can record from, uh, from uh, uh, engram cells and non-engram cells and compare them. And when they do that, they stimulate the perforant path fibers and look, for example, at the EPSPs, they find that, en that the engram cells here, the green ones here, they have larger EPSPs than the non-engram cells. So they are more efficient synapses. They can also look in the microscope at the dendrites. And then they find that the dendrites of the engram cells, the labeled cells here, those have higher density of spines. They have more synapses on them. And that is shown over here. Spines, uh, number of spines per square micron of, of, uh, of the dendritic segment. And then in addition to that, they can, uh, they can separate AMPA receptor currents from NMDA receptor currents when they stimulate the perforant path fibers. And then they find that the, here that the ratio of the AMPA currents over NMDA receptor current is larger in the uh, in the uh, in uh, engram cells than in non-engram cells, and this is exactly what's happened during LPP. You get more AMPA receptors inserted into the membrane, so it becomes stronger. But because it's more of them there, you get a larger current. So this is strongly indicative of LTP. And finally, they find that uh, uh, when they re record from both of these cells at the same time, that the, the, uh, the engram cells are more strongly connected together than non-engram cells. And that is shown uh, over here, the connection here. That's shown here, and there's a, a, quite a difference there. Okay. So, so it's, 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 it, it, it's quite remarkable what you can do with, with these modern techniques and you can play around with this in, in various ways. So I'll now come down a bit here because the, the rest here is not based on figures. So I better stay with my text. So uh, anyway, together, all these results indicate that an engram consists of a collection of engram cells that form as a result of LTP that strengthens the synapses that they form with these others. So one now sees these engrams, these collections in different parts of the brain. They see them now as the basic unit of memory. But you can make further manipulations. So since this is so specific, you can go in and ablate just these specific engram cells that relate to the shock. And, and if you inactivate, inactivate them or ablate them, the memory of that will be gone. They will never freeze uh, in, in that, um, in that uh, context. Or you can implode false memories. And, um, yeah. And you can also implant memories for something that never happened. So it's, 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 it's rather impressive. So while the hippocampus is necessary for certain types of memory, it's not sufficient. So evidence suggests that initially the memory of an event is laid down in the CA3 region of the hippocampus. But to persist, it must be consolidated. Uh, and this consolidation occurs during subsequent sleep, during the first day. And apparently in the CA1 region. 
And then during subsequent day, on the second day, you find the engram cells appearing, collection of engrams themselves related to this particular experience will appear in other parts of the, of the brain. And um, so, and if there again, they can show that LTP is instrumental in forming all these engram cells at different stages. So the end result is the formation of a collection of interconnected engrams in different parts of the cortex, representing different aspects of a particular experience from the past. So remembering then consists in reactivating these engrams and bring their activities into a conscious experience that resembles the conscious experience we had in the past. And interestingly, the, these engrams that form in the neocortex become independent of the hippocampus. And that presumably explains why HM could still remember uh, from the past before the operation but he couldn't, couldn't remember anything of new things that happened to him because that had to pass through the, through the hippocampus. And that relates it not to, to all forms of memories, but really relate to semantic memories and what's called declarative memories and spatial memories. So an important reason finding is that when we recall a past experience the engram and that can be years later the engrams underlying that recall becomes label and modifiable uh, for several hours that's when we recall a particular experience of the fact the engrams that represent that memory become label for a short period of time because it becomes reconciliated. And this is presumably to update the memory. But this ability allows for the possibility of associating the memory with some unrelated experience from the past. And then you will have a false memory. And I'm, th I'm sure we are going to hear more about that, how, how, how such memories can arise. Okay. There are not more to be said about this, many interesting experiments, but I think I will end uh, by a couple of, of personal reflections. So given the importance of LTP in understanding learning and memory, its discovery is the stuff of a Nobel Prize, okay? The fact that Tim and I have been nominated on several occasions by different people shows as much. However, I have never considered myself to be in that league. I fail to see that making a rather chance discovery as a young student without being able to follow it up, reproduce my own results, and then just leave the field should qualify. So fiddling around is how Matthew Cobb described it. <laughs> now fiddling around is often what happens in science as a prelude to some breakthrough. And I think that's how I worked in many cases. You, you do fiddle around, you do try this or that. And then suddenly, if you're lucky, some, something appears that makes sense. But in this particular case with LTP, uh, uh, the, uh, it ended just with the fiddling around. So as for Tim, his problem is that although he came with the explicit aim of studying learning and memory and made us actually do those experiments that were published in Journal of Physiology. Uh, He did not himself discover the LTP. And apart from our 1973 paper, he has not, in my view, really followed up with, 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 with the research that, 
sort of change the direction of the field. So I'm convinced that I've been much happier without the exposure and expectation that would have come with the Nobel Prize. So I have no problems with it. And I'm not waiting around in, you know, in the fall for some telephone or anything like that. All right. So Ari Liu and you have, Johan has alluded to it. Ari Liu and I are now busy studying body temperature regulation and our experiments are going well. As we move into unexplored terrain, and that's what we're doing. We are looking at things where people have never been before, muscles that they've ne never explored. And we find new and interesting things. And there are just too many new experiments to be done to make sense of it all, but we can make sense of some. So two years ago then, as you heard, uh, we published this paper in Octophysiology, and which we are now following up with new experiment, and which has then been uh, been uh, uh, sort of uh, not, uh, shortlisted for this price. It's a hundred thousand dollars, so that's money, and we could surely need it because we don't have any money at the moment for doing our experiments. So my motivation for telling you this is twofold. It shows that old people can do innovating and useful research and that it is possible to use useful and interesting research that does not cost much money. The experiment, the equipment we use is old and was in the lab before we retired. Our main expense has been purchasing rats for which we sometimes have no money. But we have richer friends who on occasions have paid for those. So we've been able to go on. And we cannot pay for itself. You cannot donate money to your own research. That cannot be done. So I'm extremely grateful to the Institute and our many friends and colleagues here for leading us, letting us work as we do. But as a final note, I would like to add that both Arin and I have been careful not to stand in the way for younger people and use space and the resources that they need. When that happens, of course, we will just have to bow out. But so far, it's not my, been my impression that that is the case. So thank you again, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teddy, for a great talk. Um, will you take some questions from the- from If the... I can hear them, I have problems. <laughs> if I can hear them, I, and well, one thing is hearing, the other thing is to understand, of course, the question. So anyway, yes. Don't look up there. Thank you very much, fantastic talk. Uh, I was just wondering, did you ever figure out why you could not reproduce the experiment? Did I ever? Did you figure out why you could not reproduce your experiment? <laughs> well, that's, I, uh, yeah, well, I don't really know the answer, but, but, um, but I, it's very likely that, that those rabbits that uh, Tim and I studied to begin with, they were delivered by a local farmer at the Institute down in Karl Johanskata for 50 Norwegian crowns each. And they had probably lived a happy life out on the farm. And, and, and those were the rabbits we, we studied at that time. Uh, when we came to, to, to Mill Hill, and later when Tony Gardner joined me in Oslo, we got rabbits from professional dealers white rabbits and it's been shown over and over again that stress inhibits LTP very strongly. My guess is that there is a, a difference here and that 
when 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 we brought our rabbits up then uh, 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 and and you know you are and they are scared of course and you are preparing to, to put the cannula in to anesthetize them and all that i think they were put under severe stress and that that inhibited the 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 uh, the ltp that that we um, uh, might have seen otherwise and um, and so uh, and and that happened in 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 in, in mill hill also but when tim and tony gardner did the, on, on the chronic experiment they saw the ltp it wasn't very impressive but they saw they, it was certainly there uh, but then again rabbits you know animals will adjust and adapt to their condition rather quickly and see there's no danger compared to, so probably that might have been that they could see it in the chronic ones but not in the acute ones and then i think that rabbits are just more uh, easily stressed than rats and 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 that's why that may be one of the reasons that it, it's been much easier to see this in rats than what we saw in rabbits and nobody has done it in the rabbit since then Any other questions? Um, Sven Harit. Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting and rich in perspective talk. Um, I have a tiny little question on some detail here. Hmm. And that is, <laughs> um, you talk about Engram cells and you're talking about the memory lying in the in a collection of engram cells however we know of course that you have shown many times here that um, each of these cells contain lots of different spines and synapses yeah and to a large extent these synapses these spines are physiologically distinct from each other uh, so my question is, to what degree do the individual synapses play a role in memory and to what degree do you have to have the whole engram cell involved? Yeah, okay. Well, th this depends on the way that the engram cells become connected together. And uh, the way they become connected together has also to do with how the individual synapses up on, 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 on each neuron are strong or weak. And, um, and uh, so it's, 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 it's very clear from the, from, from the you know, ex experiments that have been done that the same, a, a, given, a given neuron can participate in many angles. So that makes this, so extremely must, flexible so that must be synapse so it's 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 related so that a particular sort of sensory experience that that get then stored in an engram one particular experience uh that depends on the particular synapses that have been activated for that storage and then you have another experience at another time and that will activate some other other uh, uh, spines, and and then the same, and, and and that will make up another engram with some of the same neurons, but also others. So 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 they participate together in all these, but in different ways, and they will differentiate then between very small differences, you know, in 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 sensory uh, in sensory inputs. So uh, there is one thing I I, I that that I forgot to say that I think is very important here also, and that is uh, and that, um, and that's related also to this, and that is that um, the um, you cannot continue, you know, to store all sorts of experiences that you 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 have during a day or a week or a month or a year. Uh, you just can't, cannot accum start. Uh, accumulating all the, all that storage so it's not so and and there are homeostatic mechanisms in the in in the brain uh, uh, that uh, regulates this and balances this and it's also very clear that the particular neuron 
uh, a particular neuron will have, um, it, it's absolutely limited how many synapses and spines there can be on a given neuron. So when you have a new experiment and you, you, you should start uh, 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 activating or making some of them stronger and even make new ones on the same dendrite, and, and, and that's been demonstrated over and over again, but then others must disappear. So you have to forget at the same time. And there are mechanisms for that, for forgetting, for depotentiation, for long-term depression. All these are mechanisms that ensures that there is a balance here. And, and, and the more, more, most recent evidence now is that there when, 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 when in terms of semantic memory and, and this sort of memory, that when, when, when the information is passed through the dentate to the CA3, and, and gets initially sort of uh, uh, stored there, uh, the, um, and then passed on for consolidation in the CA1, then uh, 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 there are filtering processes. And they are beginning now to be, be, be clarified, uh, whereby things that are insignificant, trivial, it gets immediately stored, but then it gets eliminated before it gets consolidated. So, so, there are, so in other ways, our brain cannot be over, uh, overloaded uh, by stuff because there are these potent mechanisms for active for, forgetting. And that has to occur all the time together with learning. Yeah. On that note, it's tempting to recall the um, um, uh, story that um, Semmerlagle relates uh, from Nils Holgersson's Underbara Resa in Sverige till uh, Lapland, where he um, tells the, the chief um, uh, goods or, um, that um, uh, he asks her, how is it possible that you can have all this knowledge inside your head? And the answer is, you see, the brain is such that the more you put in, the more room there is. And the, more... the more room there is. <laughs> okay. So there is some truth in that also, isn't there? Because the a brain that is, is used much not inside the skull. Well, it no, isn't. No, no, I, I suppose the brain right. is inside the skull. Because <laughs> uh, 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 if you don't use the brain, uh, it stops being that useful. Uh, do you have any, any comments on this? <laughs> not really. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, okay. uh, okay. uh, and I think uh, yes, Peter has something for you. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Peter, for this uh, very fascinating talk. It's been really inspiring to hear you. Okay. And I hope that thank you continue to use your brain. Uh, yeah. Years ago. So, <laughs> well, I certainly hope so too. Thanks thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's all over. I'm very glad. <laughs>